Sydney for a year. Uh, I always like Australia. So hope to go back sometime soon. Uh, but this, this paper is uh, called Are Simple Mechanisms Optimal Where Agents Are Unsophisticated? Uh, this is joint work with Kyoto from Northwestern. So the starting point of uh, uh, this paper is to recognize that uh, real-life agents are not as rational as we typically model in our papers. Hence, uh, in mechanism design context, it seems useful to distinguish simple mechanisms from uh, complex mechanisms. The simple mechanisms has a lot of uh, appeal. Uh, so in particular, if the designer uses a simple mechanism, uh, it is easy for the agents to determine their optimal choice. And hence, it's also more likely that the designer's prediction about the outcome is correct. It is also easier for the designer to persuade uh, the agents to participate. So on the other hand, if you use a complex mechanism, uh, if the agents cannot really figure out what to do, or the designer does not really know how the agents will read it, then the designer most likely will lose confidence uh, in what will happen out of the mechanism. Also, you may also encounter this uh, participation issue. How do you persuade the agents to participate if they don't really know how to uh, uh, behave uh, in the mechanism? So what are uh, simple mechanisms? So of course, we recognize there are, there are many dimensions of simplicity. Uh, so here, we focus on the uh, strategic reasoning dimension. And even along this dimension, there are various notions uh, that has, uh, have appeared in the literature. So here are some examples. So a very natural benchmark uh, to think about simplicity is to uh, think about uh, strategy proof mechanisms or dominant strategy mechanisms. Uh, for such mechanisms, each agent have a, a dominant strategy, so they don't really have to reason about what their opponents will do. And hence, we, 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 we might want to call this uh, mechanism simple. Uh, having said that, uh, there's already a lot of evidence suggesting that even the designer uses a dominant strategy mechanism, uh, some agents, they simply uh, couldn't figure out that they have a dominant strategy. So partly motivated by, by these observations, uh, so Shen Wu uh, uh, proposed the notion of obviously strategy-proof mechanisms. Uh, in these mechanisms, even if the agents can't uh, do conditional reasoning, they still are able to figure out their optimal strategy. Uh, then more recently, uh, this paper by uh, Marat Fisher and Peter Choi, uh, that even strengthen the notion of uh, obviously strategy proof. And they propose, uh, among other notions, they propose the notion of strongly obviously strategy proof. Uh, so the difference between uh, OSP and SOSP is that uh, for OSP mechanism, uh, the agents are able to reason what they are going to do later. Whereas in uh, SOSP uh, P mechanisms, the agents can't really predict their own moves uh, at later stages. Uh, so th these two notions are strengthening uh, uh, dominant strategy mechanisms. Uh, there's there's, there's this, this also this paper uh, uh, called Strategically Simple Mechanism. So that's actually Tuma and I, where we wrote this paper. Uh, that's a relaxation of the definition of strategy proof mechanisms. Uh, was trying to propose a class of mechanisms that the agents can figure out what to do as long as they are able to uh, reason uh, in the first order, loosely speaking. So. So what, what mechanism is simple? What mechanism is complex? As already evidenced by the, the, the papers we have seen so far, it really depends on what we're assuming uh, the agents can or cannot do. So the, for the purpose of uh, the current paper, uh, given the assumed level of strategic sophistication, we're going to call a mechanism simple if agents can determine their optimal strategy and complex otherwise. I mean, one example uh, is if you are happy to assume that the agents are rational in the sense of not playing uh, dominated strategies, then uh, if we use a strategy proof, proof mechanisms, then that would be a simple mechanism because the agents, they have one strategy that uh, dominates every other strategy. And similarly, you can think about OSP and OSP, uh, SOSP in a similar ways. Um, Qingtao. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's a bit an unfair question, but still. Um, it seems to me like there's a simplicity in the way you can describe a game, such as a first-place auction or a K-double auction. 
mm -hmm. um, that is not going to be captured by these definitions. In particular, um, if you think about the VCG mechanism in a somewhat complicated setting, right, I think by these definitions here, it would right. be probably considered simple or Right, um, right, you know, right. you still have a dominant strategy, but clearly it's not simple, right? Because just explaining how that mechanism works is going to be quite involved, and uh, it's hard to see that it actually endows you with dominant strategies. Uh, so, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I, I certainly agree with with that, that perspective. Uh, so this this paper uh, or this perspective work taking really isolates the the, the strategic reading ability. Uh, in the sense that why really imposing some assumptions as to what the agents can do. In particular, if we think about the notion of SP, then the agents will be, I mean, by assumption, the agents will be able to reason through uh, uh, all those uh, uh, contingencies where they have a dominant strategy. Uh, I, 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 I sort of agree with what you described, uh, but that sort of seems like a, 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 from a different perspective. I mean, first and options are easy to describe. Uh, so, People might actually think first price option is easier to understand in contrast to a second price option because they think it's somewhat more intuitive. Uh, but for me, uh, I, 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 thought, I think that's, that's, that's a different uh, dimension. Uh, so one, one way to understand the perspective or the approach we take here is uh, uh, one common uh, uh, way of interpreting is to say that uh, when we think of mechanism design, we think about the, besides the mechanism itself, there's also this conversation between the designer and uh, the agents. So if the agents are able to understand things uh, such as continued reasoning, then the designer would be, would find it easy to persuade uh, the agents that in the VCG mechanism they have a dominant strategy. Whereas in the first press option, so the persuasion between the uh, designer and the agent would be uh, much more complicated. So that's my uh, perspective on, 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 on this. So roughly speaking, these are two different perspectives uh, in my head. Yeah, but it may, I mean, I don't want to give you too hard a time on that, but it may be much easier to convince people to participate in a game whose rules they understand. So maybe that's the first sort of issue, rather than participating in a game that has a simple equilibrium. Um, but uh, right, right. So as you see, I will, I will actually touch upon the, the issue of participation. So in, in this paper, uh, so the, the decision of uh, participation is indulgently uh, 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 captured. And when we say that it's easy to persuade the agents to participate, even in complex mechanisms, uh, so we will have a very formal sense uh, to discuss on that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. So, <clears throat> so all of you are just to understand or, or give a, a, a further understanding on how do we think about mechanism design uh, when agents are unsophisticated. So there's already a lot of a progress uh, made in the literature, uh, but so far, uh, at least those papers that I've shown uh, you earlier, uh, they have focused on uh, formulating uh, different notions of simplicity, as well as uh, characterizing the class of mechanisms that are simple according to these notions. So however, uh, if you are the mechanism designer, right? So you don't really care about whether the mechanism is simple or not. You don't really care about whether the agents can figure out their optimal strategy or not. So you as the designer, you have your own objective in mind. You have some objective function. You are trying to maximize your own uh, expected utility. Right? You care about optimality. So we try to sort of think about simplicity and optimality at the same time uh, in this paper. Uh, then the key observation is that as long as the designer is ultimately concerned with maximizing her own payoff, which is typically modeled in mechanism design, then uh, in many cases, complex mechanisms are unambiguously better uh, to simple ones. Okay, so I will explain uh, what I mean by unambiguously preferred uh, using some examples. So our paper studies uh, several notions. In particular, we study uh, SP. OSP as well as uh, SOSP. Uh, so the results are, are general. Uh, they are robust to the particular notion that we use. Uh, but for the examples, uh, I will particularly uh, use the uh, solution concept of OSP. So the first example is a classic example. This is the single unit auction uh, with n bidders. Uh, well, 
interested in the case where uh, the agents can't engage in community reasoning as modeled uh, by uh, Shen Wu. Uh, for this kind of agents, right, uh, there's a very interesting uh, feature is that uh, while second class auction and ascending class auction, they are strategically equivalent if agents can do community reasoning, uh, but if, if they cannot, uh, then the agents will find it ascending clock auction easier and it will find a second press option uh, much harder. Uh, so formally, uh, Shen Wu's notion of OSP will classify a second press option as not OSP and ascending clock auction with, uh, as uh, OSP. Uh, so this provides a, a sort of like a justification uh, to use uh, ascending clock auction rather than a second press option. So now I would like to draw your attention to actually a, a third mechanism uh, that we call ascending clock auction with jump bidding. Okay, so ascending clock auction with jump bidding differs from the ascending clock auction in only one aspect. That is, each bidder is allowed to speed up the clock by making a, a higher bid than the current clock price. But the first observation is that this mechanism is not OSP. Uh, because the decision as to whether to make a, a jump bid, uh, that's going to confuse the agent. So for a very simple example, uh, if a bidder's valuation is 10, and then the current clock price is five, and he's thinking about whether to uh, jump bid to eight. Okay, so if the agents can't engage in continued reasoning, then the agent will be confused. So here's why. Uh, if the bidder jump is to eight, then the best case payoff for him is actually two, uh, if the bidder does not make a jump bid, then the worst case curve for uh, him or her is, is zero. Okay, so one strategy does not uh, dominate the other in the OSP sense. But because the agents will be confused, then the designer could also not predict what's going to happen. Okay, it's not clear to the designer whether the jump bidding will occur or not. Uh, nonetheless, if none of the bidders jump bids, then this mechanism is the same as earlier. It's the same as the ascending clock auction. It delivers the same expected revenue. On the other hand, if at least the one bidder uh, jump bids, then that's going to deliver a significantly higher uh, expected revenue. Okay. So in our terminology, we will say that uh, the later uh, mechanism, the ascending clock auction with jump bidding, weakly dominates the ascending clock auction. So. This example also uh, conveys a, a very a simple message, actually. Uh, the message is that the designer uh, could actually give the agents an additional option, uh, provided if the option is taken, that's going to benefit the designer. In this case, why don't we simply do that? So formally, the, the notion of a weak dominance is to say that the, the complex mechanism is it, it, never worse off and at least sometimes it's going to be a strictly better off. Then in the paper or, or later, uh, I will give you like, a, we will show that simple mechanisms are weakly dominated in, in many settings actually. Uh, uh, to, here, just a yeah. quick question. So looking yeah. at the definition of weak dominance, it's, yeah. it's only taking the perspective of the person who is running the auction or the mechanism designer. Exactly, yeah. So, Let's think of many situations where you have, for instance, auctions uh, that correspond to deferred acceptance type of auctions, right? You would have a lattice and you would have the extreme point of that lattice giving you one the best for the buyers and one the best for the sellers. So if the seller is the mechanism designer, his interest is perfectly opposed with that of the buyers. Okay. And in that case, we know that there is a trade-off between efficiency and strategy proofness. So all the mechanisms that make it strategy proof for uh, the buyers to reveal their preferences or for the people in school choice type of problems to tell the truthfully what, what they want mm -hmm. uh, are going to give you one extreme point of this lattice, which is the least preferred by the seller if you want but in those settings we don't care about the designer right we want to do the best for the agent so we sacrifice strategy proofness so according to mm -hmm. this definition it is as if you're looking at this problem which has um, the lattice structure so there is an opposition of interest 
by the lattice structure. And then as soon as I ask this weak dominance, isn't it as if I ask on the other side to violate something like substitutability, which would give me the best for the uh, opposite party, which would be the bidders in your case? I'm not entirely, I don't think I entirely understand your comment, uh, but let, let me give it a try. Uh, so, so here we're taking the perspective of the designer. Okay, uh, so we have to think about what the designer wants. Uh, so in the option setting, in this example, the option wants revenue, uh, but you could think of like different settings, uh, such as the one you described with the buyers and sellers, but on top of that, there's the designer. Uh, the, the, the designer in that setting probably uh, wants something different, such as welfare. Uh, but, and, and another thing is that uh, it's, it's essentially what we're doing here is it, a trade-off uh, between simplicity and optimality. Uh, so exactly, uh, we are trying to make uh, some types uh, not incentive compatible uh, so that we can gain better. But I think at the core, uh, what you are describing is exactly what, what, what you are trying to do. Exactly. So, so you're, you're inducing some of the bidders to, to break incentive compatibility, which is as if in an auction procedure, you would violate mm -hmm. somewhere substitutability. So in a sense, mm -hmm. your weak dominance condition on the seller, it is as if I ask substitutability to be broken off at some point for mm -hmm. the buyers. That, that's yeah. the question. Mm -hmm. it, it, I, I think so. I see, okay. Yeah. Uh, so here, uh, we, we can also uh, discuss whether uh, the notion of a weak dominance is good enough. Uh, so, so personally, I, I think this is a good enough reason, right? Because the superior mechanism is always really better and sometimes it's really better. Uh, so one analogy that I could give you is to, to think about the, the, the two strategies, one strategy really dominates the other. Uh, so if, for me, these are quite similar. Uh, but you could still argue that uh, if you have a very pessimistic uh, designer, but even if sometimes uh, the superior, the compact mechanism is good to do strictly better, but you have a very pessimistic designer who don't think at all those scenarios are going to occur, uh, then uh, the, the compact mechanism and the simple mechanism, they are going to be exactly the same. So this is as if you are taking the max mean criteria literally. Uh, which is why in the paper, we also talk about a stronger notion uh, that we call a strong dominance. So again, this example is uh, for the solution concept of OSP. Uh, so this example is interesting in own right. I, I probably should say that. Uh, so this is a trading platform that intermediates trades between two dealers. Uh, the platform's objective is to try to maximize the profit or commission. Uh, each dealer can either buy or short sell one unit of asset. Uh, the platform cannot hold any inventory, so we require the ex-post to market clearing. So the table you see at the below, that's the probability distribution. Uh, so this model is, is sometimes called the, 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 the bilateral trade with unidentified traders. Uh, I, I think Simon has a paper on this. It, it, Simon calls this an asset market. Uh, so this example is sort of simple. We have only two traders. Each trader has only two types. So we can uh, talk about what is the optimal OSP mechanism here. Uh, the optimal OSP mechanism has a, a simple interpretation. It can be thought of as a, a ascending clock option. Okay, so the platform approaches dealer A first and asks whether dealer A would like to sell the asset at the price zero. If a dealer A says yes, then the trade is implemented. Otherwise, the platform approaches dealer B and asks whether dealer B uh, would like to sell the asset at the price one third. If dealer B says yes, then the trade is implemented. Otherwise, uh, there's no trade at all. Uh, so how would the platform make money? Uh, so whenever there is trade, then the platform is going to charge a commission fee of one third to the buyer, okay? So by construction, uh, the expected profit of the platform is going to be one third, uh, the commission, multiplied by the probability of trade. So, let, let, let's spend some time. Uh, w let me spend some time walking through uh, the, uh, the strategic reasoning process of the agents or why they have an OSP strategy. Uh, so let's focus on dealer A first. Uh, so if dealer A's uh, valuation is zero, uh, then dealer A would actually say yes. 
uh, or accepted the offer in the first stage. Uh, if dealer A says yes, uh, the trade is implemented as a price zero, dealer A's payoff is zero. Uh, if a dealer A says no, uh, one of two things will happen uh, in second stage. If there's no trade, dealer A's payoff is again zero. If there is trade in the second stage, then dealer A would have to buy at a higher price than his valuation, so he has a negative payoff. So it's clear that uh, the type zero of dealer A has an OSP strategy uh, to accept the offer. Uh, if dealer A has a valuation two thirds, uh, then the OSP strategy is actually to reject the initial offer. Uh, if dealer A accepts the initial offer, uh, dealer A's payoff will be negative because the valuation is two thirds and he would have to sell at the price zero. Uh, if she says no, then one of two things will happen in the second stage. But in both cases, it's easy to verify that dealer A's payoff is zero. Uh, so now, if we move on to dealer B, uh, if dealer, B's, dealer B only moves in the second stage, he has a very simple choice, it's a binary action. Uh, if dealer, dealer B's valuation is one third, uh, then dealer B should uh, accept uh, the offer in the second stage. Uh, so here, if you do the calculation, actually both actions would deliver the, the same payoff of zero. Uh, that's not really a, a big concern. I mean, if it concerns you, just throw an if down there. It's, it's nothing, really. Uh, Lastly, uh, if dealer B has val valuation one, uh, then dealer B has an OSP strategy to reject the offer in the second stage. Okay, because rejecting the offer, the payoff would be zero, but accepting the offer in the second stage, he would have to sell at, the, at, at a lower price than his valuation. So with that uh, reasoning, we actually can see uh, if we follow these strategies, which I highlighted in the slide, uh, to trade occurs except when uh, dealer A's valuation is two thirds and the dealer B's valuation is one. So that's the only scenario uh, in which there's no trade. And hence we can calculate the expected profit of the platforms that's going to be one over five. Uh, so intuitively, uh, the reason that there's no trade or the reason why there's an inefficient outcome for this particular uh, profile is that if there's a trade here, uh, then accepting the initial offer would not be a OSP strategy for type zero uh, in the first stage. So that, this is the optimal uh, OSP mechanism, which generates an uh, expected payoff of uh, one over five for the designer. So now uh, let me propose a, a superior mechanism, a complex mechanism that is going to be superior. Uh, the, the superior mechanism also has a natural interpretation, but this time it's going to be a, a descending clock option. Uh, the platform approaches dealer B first and asks whether dealer B would like to buy the asset at the price one. So this time it's the price is high first, then drops over time, right? Uh, if dealer B says yes, then the trade is implemented. If dealer B says no, uh, then the platform goes to dealer A and checks whether dealer A would like to buy the asset at the price two thirds. Uh, again, if dealer A says yes, the trade is implemented. If dealer A says no, uh, then the platform is going to try again. The platform is going to go back to dealer B and ask whether dealer B would like to buy the asset at the price one over three. Uh, if dealer B says yes, the trade is implemented. If this dealer B says no, uh, then there's no trade. Okay. Uh, so the platform is going to charge a commission fee of one third uh, to the seller. So we can also try to analyze uh, in this uh, complex mechanism how the agents are going to reason, uh, assuming that they cannot do conditional reasoning. Uh, so for dealer A, who moves in the second stage, if dealer A has a valuation zero, then she has a, an OSP strategy to say no, because saying no, uh, one of two things will happen. Both will generate a payoff of zero to the dealer A. If dealer A says yes uh, to the offer, then dealer A would have to buy the asset at, at a larger price than for valuation, which leads to a negative bill. So if dealer A has a valuation two over three, uh, then dealer A is going to uh, accept the offer in the second stage. Now let's move on to dealer B. Uh, if dealer B's valuation is one over three, uh, then dealer B is, uh, has an OSP strategy, which is, which is going to be uh, rejecting the initial offer and accepting the final offer. Uh, 
I mean, it's easy to see why, uh, but maybe let, let me not spend too much time uh, going through the numbers. Uh, the more interesting case is when B and B have variation one. So this is the, 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 the type uh, that, that, that is going to be uh, strategically confused. Uh, so this type does not have an OSP strategy. Uh, let's look at his options, right? He could say yes in the first stage, meaning that he agreed to buy the asset at the test one. So his valuation is also one, so his payoff is going to be zero by accepting the offer. Uh, so another strategy for, for type one dealer B is going to uh, reject the initial offer, but accepting the, 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 the final offer. Uh, so if B, uh, dealer B uh, chooses this particular strategy, uh, then, I mean, he, he could potentially incur loss. This is because dealer A could say yes in the second stage, means dealer B would have to sell the asset uh, at a lower price than his valuation. That leads to a negative payoff. Uh, but uh, dealer B could also benefit uh, in, a, in a scenario in which dealer A says no in the second stage, then dealer B could actually buy the asset at a much lower price than his valuation, leading to a positive payoff. So these two strategies cannot be ranked. Uh, so that means type one of dealer B is going to be uh, what we call strategically confused. confused. Uh, so here, uh, maybe let me say uh, one word about the participation decision. So what is happening here is that uh, type one of dealer B is confused between two strategies. Uh, one of them uh, will actually uh, obviously dominate non-participation. The other does not, but uh, one of them uh, obviously dominates non-participation. So if we think of the, the participation as a strategy, uh, and, and then the option of opting out is actually obviously dominated. So the agent does not know what to do, but he knows for sure that he should not stay out. Uh, so this is, this is one way we model uh, participation. Uh, so later during my presentation, I will talk about the other uh, stronger sense in which we can model a participation decision. Uh, so now, if we look at this strategy, uh, so three types uh, just have a, uh, OSP. Pardon, just a uh, quick clarification. So is it going to be sure. the case that I always know the outside option and can compare against it? Uh, there are two different ways we model the participation decision. Uh, one is probably ex ante, the other is probably more like ex post. Uh, so the sense in which I discussed just now, this is probably more like ex ante. Uh, you decide whether you participate uh, at the beginning or not. So here, if we follow these strategies of the, the, the two bidders, uh, two dealers, although we don't really know what dealer B will do, we lose that prediction power when we use this compact mechanism. But as you can see, trick always occurs, no matter what dealer A and dealer B does. That means uh, because trick always happens, the platform is going to guarantee an expected revenue of uh, one over three despite the fact that uh, one dealer is, uh, one type of one dealer is confused. Uh, so, so Alex, so just to clarify, I have 75 minutes, right? Or, or should I think of 60? No, it's one hour and 15 minutes. And as you're taking questions along, you can use all that. Great. Uh, so, so strong dominance, this is a, a, a stronger requirement. It requires that the designer always obtains a strictly higher expected payoff in all cases, no matter how agents resolve their confusion. We require the, the designer to be a strictly better off. Uh, so later, we will identify structured environments in which strong dominance can happen. Uh, so the key takeaway of this paper uh, is trying to suggest that uh, the optimality of simple mechanisms should be established in, for any given setting. So there's a lot of benefit thinking about uh, simple mechanism. So it, it's not, it should not be viewed as a criticism of all these uh, simplicity notions, but rather think that uh, for any given setting, if we have determined by between simple and complex mechanisms, uh, we should access, exercise um, some caution. Uh, on the flip side, we also show that in some settings or under some conditions, uh, we are able to show that simple mechanisms are not uh, strongly dominated. So if you wish, you can call this a foundation of simple mechanisms for these settings. Uh, so I will not talk about the, the related literature, but just to mention uh, one thing very quickly. 
so well, the leading interpretation of our exercise uh, is on simple mechanisms versus complex mechanisms. Uh, but you could interpret, interpret our exercise as a, a robust mechanism design paper uh, in the following manner. Uh, the, the designer uh, does not have uh, reliable information about the reasoning process of the agents, except uh, from some very minor rationality assumptions imposed on the part of the agents. Both interpretations are actually the same. They didn't really have anything different. All right. Uh, maybe let me pause one second. Yeah. Um, just yeah, one one question on that somewhat nagging point about um, optimal auction uh, example, a sending clock auction example. So yeah. uh, you say that yeah, this is kind of robust because the um, the seller cannot do worse with allowing for this jump bidding. Um, right. But if you're going to do better than the optimal auction, as uh, uh, Alex has uh, sort of indicated, you have to depart somewhere from incentive compatibility so that you can do better than the optimal auction. Right. Now, if you allow right. one agent to depart from incentive compatibility, can't I then say, well, uh, as bidders, we have uh, beliefs about each other, and as soon as I see someone do something that he shouldn't be doing, <laughs> which is jump right. bidding, then I'm going right. to update my beliefs and we all drop out. Right? That would be a perfect Bayesian equilibrium of that auction, and then um, I think the uh, the seller would not be better off than in the optimal auction. Right. Uh, so two comments on that. Uh, so the, the first comment is that. Uh, I think what we're saying is that the jump bidding contains some kind of signal if you use the, the perfect bidding the equilibrium. Uh, so the signaling incentive only comes about when, the, uh, when there's an interdependent valuation in the model. Uh, so for prior to value settings, uh, the, the, whether the other agents jump bidding or not, that's irrelevant. Uh, the, the second comment is that uh, we are not thinking about agents who who, uh, who, who, who acts according to the bit and equilibrium. So our agents are, are, are unsophisticated. They don't, read, they don't form a distribution of, of their burden types. They don't uh, uh, base an update. Uh, they, they simply reason through what they should not do. And if after they ruling out what things they cannot do, they have a single strategy left, then they will do that. So otherwise they will be confused. Uh, so, so the assumption is also slightly different. But precisely because the assumptions are different, we can do better uh, than the uh, than the ascending clock clock option or even the Meyerson setting. I mean, otherwise you couldn't do better than the, than the Meyerson uh, option, right? Yeah. All, all I'm all I'm saying is that there's there's a downside risk, right? I mean, um, if if uh, even with private values, right, we can use this jump bidding as a coordination device to depart from our otherwise dominant strategies. Um, you're allowing some bidder to deviate from their obviously dominant strategies. Um, then I think as a um, as a participant in that auction or as a, as a somebody who is evaluating that auction design, I should allow the other agents also to to depart from their uh, dominant strategies. And once I do that, these payoff guarantees are not so clear anymore. But um, again, I, I think. You are modeling agents in slightly different ways from the way we model uh, the agents. So all our agents are doing is to not play OSP dominated strategies. So they face a, a sending call option with jump bidding. They know that they need to avoid strategies that are dominated in the OSP sense. So they will not drop out by, by assumption. So I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that what you, everyone is describing is, does not make sense. I'm only saying that if we assume the agents behave the way we assume them, then they will not behave in the way you describe. Yeah, okay. So, so that, it, yeah, it, it's, that, it's like that's fine, but, uh, but I, I think, you know, from a practical kind of a mechanism I, design perspective, you would want to have something that's robust to behavior okay. that's both a bit myopic and to sophisticated behavior. Uh, whereas okay. here you now seem to be zeroing in on the non-sophistication of these agents. And I see. Sort of okay. That. Your, your point is well taken. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So let me move on. Uh, 
So the model is going to be a bit long, uh, but it's actually simple. So what I plan to do is to uh, not talk about all these different notations, but I will get you through whatever uh, these notations are needed. Uh, so there's a set of agents, a set of alternatives. Theta i is agent i's type. Uh, UI is agent I's utility function. V is the designer's utility function. Uh, so this is an important assumption. The designer is an expected utility maximizer. So we're going to use this assumption. Uh, we're going to relate this, uh, this assumption strongly later. Uh, so the designer is allowed to use a randomization device. Uh, so if there's a randomization device is used, we are going to think of it as a dummy agent labeled as i equal to zero. When we use the upper bar, uh, this means we include nature uh, in this profile as well. Uh, then we're going to consider finite mechanisms that are imperfect information, extensive form games. Uh, this is because we talk about the solution concept of OSD and SOSD. Uh, let, let, let's forget about those notations uh, on this slide. So that's just for formality. Uh, so, we're going to talk about three solution concepts. So the first one is strategy proof. Uh, so one strategy, SI, is SP dominated for type theta i. Uh, if we can find another strategy, SI prime, which is always weakly better and sometimes strictly better, uh, regardless of, of what other agents do. Uh, so here, uh, we think of nature as an additional player. Uh, this doesn't really matter too much for our results. Uh, it's mainly because that we want the SP, OSP, and SOSP to be sort of consistent. Because for the other uh, two solution concepts, the nature is sort of uh, as a, a player in the game. Also, from the perspective of simplicity, uh, uh, it, it's probably also natural to think of the uh, randomization device as a player, because the agents still would need to reason further. Uh, then the solution concept of OSP, uh, where say that a strategy SI is OSP dominated for a certain type theta i, if we can find another strategy SI prime, such that whenever these two strategies first depart from each other, uh, then the worst case scenario under the strategy SI prime is going to be weakly higher than the best case scenario for the strategy uh, SI. So this is a standard uh, definition, the same as the uh, insurance paper. Uh, then the third solution concept, the strongly or obviously strategy proof, uh, this is quite similar to OSP. The only difference is when we take the inf operation and the soup operation, when we take the worst case and the best case, the agents also take into account uh, their own moves in later stages. So this is because the motivation for this solution concept is that uh, the agents don't ha have the uh, ability to foresee what they will do in the future. So all our results and all the examples from now onwards, uh, they are going to be uh, working for all solution concepts. So I'm going to use uh, K to, uh, to denote any solution concept from this step. So here's our assumption on what the agents can, or what the agents can do. Uh, so we assume that uh, for any agent i, for each type of this agent i, uh, so this type uh, knows that to avoid uh, a k-dominated strategy, if we use the solution concept k. Okay, for example, if we're talking about uh, the solution concept of OSP, then the agents are rational in the sense of not playing OSP-dominated strategy. So this is something that the designer is willing to impose uh, on the part of the agent. Uh, Notice that this is a relatively weak be assumption on behavior because there's no mutual knowledge of uh, this rationality. Uh, there's also no common knowledge of this rationality. It's relatively weak. Once we have this uh, solution concept of a uh, dominance, a K dominance, then we can talk about which strategy is K dominated by another strategy. So this notation denotes that the strategy SI prime, according to the solutions concept K, uh, dominates the strategy SI if agent I's type is theta I. Then we can easily, uh, I mean, in principle, we can easily uh, write down the set of undominated strategies. The UI case theta I, this contains all strategies of agent I that are not K dominated if agent I has, value, uh, has type theta I. 
we talk about finite mechanisms, uh, which is why uh, this is always uh, naive. So that assumption on uh, uh, strategic sophistication is the only assumption that the designer is willing to impose on the agents. Uh, Apart, aside from that, uh, the designer has no idea how the agents uh, are going to behave. Maybe the agents knows how to behave, it's just that the designer does not understand uh, the reasoning process of the agents. So, uh, definition, the so fixed mechanism gamma, uh, a type of some agent is going to be strategically confused if he has at least the two strategies uh, that are undominated. If such a type exists, then we're going to call this mechanism uh, gamma complex. Uh, in contrast, a mechanism is simple if no type is uh, strategically confused. Then the formal definition of weak dominance and strong dominance. Uh, this is essentially what I described earlier in words, uh, because if you use a complex mechanism, uh, many things could happen. Uh, there, are, there are many different values of the expected value of the uh, designer. So we're looking at a set of values. And uh, this simply capture, the weak dominance here, the definition simply captures, you are always really better off and sometimes strictly better off. Uh, then the formal definition of strong dominance captures that uh, uh, you are always uh, strictly better off. So now is the, the participation constraint. Uh, so we have two slightly different models, uh, uh, modeling uh, approach towards the participation constraint. Uh, so the first approach is called the, the partial incentives to participate. So this is the weaker requirement. It requires, in order uh, to encourage participation, all that we need is for each type of each agent, the strategy of opting out is K-dominated. Because it's K-dominated, then the agents will not do that and hence will participate. So this is one perspective. This perspective is the best used when we think of uh, the opting out as uh, a strategy at the beginning of the game. If you're not happy with the, uh, the partial incentive to participate, so the stronger notion is going to be called a full incentive to participate. So this requires not only that the strategy of opting out is K-dominated, but further it requires the strategy of opting out is K-dominated by any strategy that is not K-dominated. So it requires more. Uh, so the second requirement would guarantee that uh, uh, whenever the agents uh, participate in the mechanism, because they are, they are confused, they can do many things, but no matter which thing they do, that thing is going to be better than the thing out. So we will use uh, uh, either one of these two uh, participation constraints uh, in our analysis. Uh, okay, with dominance. But in the interest of time, uh, so let me not uh, read through this entire proposition to you, uh, but merely to point out that so what we are doing here is essentially uh, trying to take the message uh, in the ascending clock auction and generalize it to many settings. So the message in the ascending clock auction is to say, uh, the designer should think of ways to uh, give the agents additional options, provided if the options are taken, they're actually going to benefit the, uh, the designer. So let me show you a few more uh, examples where this uh, observation can be used. Uh, so this second application for weak dominance, this is the bilateral trade. This is a very classical Myers and statistics model. Uh, we have a welfare maximizing mechanism designer. The transfers are allowed, but we require budget balance. Uh, so it follows from a different paper, Hackett and Rogerson maybe. Uh, shows that the optimal strategy-proof mechanism uh, is the positive price mechanism. Uh, then it, it follows that the optimal uh, OSP mechanism as the optimal SOSP mechanism is the same uh, positive price mechanism. So we are going to argue the optimal simple mechanism, whichever notion you use, uh, because they all lead to the same positive price mechanism, we are going to show that it's a weak dominated. So positive price mechanism uh, works as follows very quickly. Uh, so the designer is going to put the price, let's say P, and ask the seller and the buyer whether they are willing to trade at the price P. The trade occurs if and only if both dealers agree. So here's a, a superior mechanism. Uh, 
So the designer will still choose the same price B. And the designer first asks the seller, okay, uh, whether the seller uh, would like to uh, refuse trade. Okay, that's one thing the seller could do. He could say no. Uh, but the seller, if the seller agrees to trade, the seller could also lower the price only if the seller wants to. So after the seller has potentially lowered the price, then the designer is going to ask the buyer whether the buyer would like to trade at the uh, potentially lowered price. So here what happens is that the seller is going to be confused as to whether to lower the price or not. So those, the strategy of not lowering the price and lowering the price, these two strategies are not, one strategy does not dominate the other, no matter which solution concept you use. So, but, so it's never worse off than before because the designer cares about welfare. The designer, designer cares about the, uh, wants to encourage trading provided they are efficient. Uh, but when there are some cases the designer is going to be strictly better off. So that's the scenario in which the seller is going to uh, lower the price because that generates a more efficient trade than, uh, than earlier. So this is a welfare maximizing example. Uh, so the next application is a revenue maximization. Uh, it is, it's fairly general. It's, you have a, a designer that tries to maximize expected revenue. Uh, so here, it's actually very easy to construct a, a mechanism that's better. Uh, suppose there are two agents. Okay, so what the designer could do uh, is to pick one player uh, at random, and at the beginning of the game, the designer tells this particular agent I that you can use the previous mechanism. Uh, you can choose the previous simple mechanism if you want, but here's an additional option you can do. You can actually play a game with another guy, uh, say a uh, player J. So in that player J, uh, so in that additional option, you, player I, is going to play a game with player J, and the game is as follows. Uh, the game has only two outcomes. One outcome is player I pays a, a large amount M to the designer, and the player J receives a, a small amount epsilon. And the other scenario is player I receives a large amount M from the designer, and the player J receives zero. So from the perspective of player I, player I is going to be confused because he cannot rank uh, whether to take the additional option or not. Uh, but from the perspective of the designer, uh, as long as M is sufficiently large and E is sufficiently small, this additional option is actually going to uh, be better than the original simple mechanism. This is because player J uh, will actually uh, choose the first option out of the two because player J would like to receive this E small amount. But player I cannot reason through that thinking process. So you can see this very simple argument works for all uh, uh, revenue maximization settings. However, when we want to uh, be cautious in the interpretation of this result, uh, so we are actually thinking that if this we really use this, this complex mechanism, maybe the, the, this additional option that generates a strictly higher expected revenue for the designer, maybe that's not going to materialize at all. Maybe the agents somehow can recognize not to do that. Uh, so the message of this example uh, is to illustrate that uh, weak dominance is easy. If your objective only to say that we want weakly dominate a simple mechanism, then this is one of many ways uh, that can get, get this done. And this is indeed very, very simple. On the other hand, uh, we actually show uh, in some settings you cannot uh, weakly dominate uh, the optimal simple mechanism. Uh, so this small result is uh, on an optimality foundation for posted price mechanisms. Uh, so the result says that if you have a single buyer and there exists a unique optimal simple mechanism generically, uh, then for the solution concept of a strategy proof and obviously strategy proof, you cannot find a complex mechanism that weakly dominates uh, the optimal simple mechanism, provided that we require the complex mechanism has to satisfy full incentives to participate. So there are two assumptions in this uh, result. The first is this uh, sort of like generic uh, assumption on generic, uh, that's a unique optimal simple mechanism. So that cannot be dropped. So we have one example saying this is dropped, then the result is not true. Furthermore, uh, maybe more interestingly, 
uh, that conclusion I showed you just now, so the conclusion fails if we use the solution concept of SOSB. Uh, the, the reasoning is actually simple. Uh, if you have a single buyer, the optimal SOSB mechanism is to simply post the price. Uh, I think I used the P star. You simply post the price P star to this buyer and the buyer has, faces a take it or leave it offer. So this is the optimal SOSP mechanism. But here, uh, rather than using the posted price mechanism, you could use a one person deciding clock auction. So this auction format is basically you start at a, at a high price, then you decrease over time until the minimum price P star, then you stop. So the, the reason why this is superior in the weak dominance sense is similar to the ascending clock auction, uh, because the agents cannot reason through what they will do later. So a guy uh, who has high valuation might actually choose to buy at a price that's strictly higher than Pista because he's worried if he delays until later, he might not actually make that purchasing uh, option. So this is how this mechanism is better than the optimal uh, S SOSP mechanism. So this construction of the superior mechanism is also sort of odd. Uh, but I, I, I sort of like wish to point out uh, in order to show the superior mechanism is indeed a superior, we are using the exact set of assumptions that motivates the solution concept of SOSB. Uh, all right. Uh, are there any questions on weak dominance? Hi, Simon. Yeah. Uh, me again. Uh, just, yeah. uh, you know, the terminology uh, strategically confused. Um, seems to refer to very different things in, in some sense, like in the Myers and Satisfied Haggerty Rochardson problem you're looking at, right? There, yeah. the seller uh, just doesn't have any um, dominant strategies, right? In his, and right. and uh, if he has a good belief about the bias distribution, choosing P prime less than P may very well be the right. optimal thing to do, right? So he seems a very sophisticated player in some right. sense, right? You, you would do the base Nash thing, if you like. Yeah, um, exactly. Whereas the other agents in, uh, say, ascending clock auction, they seem to be a little bit dumb, <laughs> if, if mm -hmm. you uh, pardon my French. Mm -hmm. So is there, <laughs> is there a way of, of disentangling these two different notions of strategically confused? That, 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 that's a very good point. I, I, I think some time ago, Piotr and I actually talked about, we also have the sense that uh, in some of the examples that we, we study when we constructed the superior mechanisms, it, is, it seems like the, the construction is some, somewhat done <laughs> in your words. Uh, whereas in other uh, settings, the, the agents are truly uh, confused. Uh, we, we thought about this, but we, we don't know how formally uh, to detangle, in, disentangle formally uh, the, the difference between the two. Uh, so I, I don't have a very good answer, but, but that, that's a good question. We thought about it, we're not really sure how to uh, proceed with that. Uh, Gentle, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the, the distinction between simple versus complex, uh, can you actually describe that in terms of base Nash? So the simple base Nash equilibrium uh, mechanism is the one that has a unique base Nash versus complex one has multiple. Uh, no. Is it different from what you are saying uh, in terms of, uh, I don't know. That, 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 that's a tough question. Uh, we also thought about this, but uh, in the end, at least uh, my understanding, this is not necessarily a Piotr's understanding. My understanding is that it's not clear to how to think about simplicity versus uh, a, a simple mechanism versus complex mechanism if we use the solution concept of business equilibrium. Uh, what you are suggesting seems like one way uh, to proceed, uh, but I haven't saw this true. Uh, I think it's conceptually, okay. uh, there's some conceptual difficulties. Okay. All right, uh, let me move on. Uh, so I will be talking about the, the strong dominance of the simple mechanism now. So again, all the results here, all the examples here, they work for all solution concepts. Uh, so the first result I will talk about is, we, we, we think there's a, a certain weakness of simple mechanisms. 
whichever notion of simplicity that you use. This is because uh, at least the way it's modeled in the uh, literature, if we want a mechanism to be a simple mechanism, such as a, a dominant strategy mechanism, the requirement is that for every type of every agent, this type would have to have to uh, have a simple strategy, such as a dominant strategy. That's overly restrictive. Why is that the case? Because if we think about an expected utility uh, maximizing a uh, designer, so the behavior of some types is insignificant in two senses. Uh, the first sense is that maybe the designer doesn't, doesn't really care about this particular type. Okay, this, this type does not contribute to the designer's payoff. Uh, I think additional, more, more sensible uh, reason is that this type has a, a low probability. Okay, so the behavior of some types, they are not significant, significant enough uh, for the designer because either they don't contribute or they uh, have a low probability. Then there are many environments in which the set of implementable outcomes will shrink as the type spaces grows. So think about voting. If you have, require a large domain, then there's nothing much you can do. If you require a small domain, then you can do a lot of things. Okay, so if the set of implementable outcomes shrinks as the type space grows, then there's a very natural trade-off between a mechanism that is simple on a subset of the type space with remaining types being confused and making the mechanism simple for all types. Okay, so by requiring the mechanism is simple only on a subset of types, uh, it, it has both plus and minuses. The plus side is that you only require simplicity on a subset of types, so you can implement a lot more. But the downside is that some types are going to be confused. So the other set, the set of types are going to be confused, then they may start to, to do crazy things. But as we argued, they may have low probabilities or the designer may not really care about those types that much. Then in many cases, this trade-off will be actually resolved uh, in favor of a contest mechanism. Okay. Again, it, it's a very uh, simple message. Uh, so let me illustrate this uh, uh, message using a simple example, a voting example. There are two agents and three alternatives, A, B, and C. Uh, there are six possible types for each agent. Uh, each A is, is a ranking of the three alternatives. Now, each agent gets utility one if the top choice is implemented, half if the second choice is implemented, and zero otherwise. Uh, the distribution of types is RID uniform. Uh, the designer's objective function uh, is to maximize routing welfare. That's the minimum of the U1, U2. Uh, the designer is also risk averse. Uh, so the function v is strictly concave. Uh, so let me also mention that uh, a lot of the details in the example don't really matter. So we're just making it nice. Uh, so this concavity, you can remove it. This distribution id, you can also remove it by changing uh, uh, some other things. So the best simple mechanism for any k uh, is going to be a dictator. So the outcome is uh, provided by the table on the left. Here, the role player is going to be the dictator, uh, choosing a or b or c. Uh, so I'm going to show illustrate that we can do better. Okay, instead of the dictator, I'm going to think of a delegation mechanism in which the designer delegates the choice of a menu to the role player. So the role player chooses a menu out of many menus. So after the role player chooses a menu, the column player is going to take an alternative from the chosen menu. So the superior mechanism is actually uh, easy to describe. So now we can still allow the role player to choose A for sure, or choose B for sure, or choose the menu AC. So this mechanism is complex. Uh, I mean, first of all, for the column player, uh, the column player always faces a straightforward choice problem because he takes one thing out of the menu. That, that's trivial. Uh, for the role player, uh, if the role player likes A the best or the B the best, then they still have their k-dominant strategy, whichever k we're thinking about. Uh, if the role player's type is CAB, uh, then by choosing the strategy AC, the worst case that could happen to him is A. Uh, by choosing the other two menus, the best thing that could happen to this uh, role player is either A or B. So it's easy to see that regardless of which solution concept we are using, uh, the role player has a k-dominant strategy to choose the menu AC. Okay, so five types still, read, uh, still have a k-dominant strategy. Uh, 
so the last type is the type CBA. Uh, for type CBA, uh, of course, the menu A, the strategy of menu A is going to be K-dominated, whichever K we're thinking about. However, the other two strategies, menu B and menu AC, uh, they are not K-dominated. Okay, so here we have a scenario where out of six types for the role player, five types still have a simple strategy, whereas the, the sixth type uh, is going to be a strategically confused in, in our terminology. So the, the, the sixth type is going to do a, a, a crazy things, or more formally, it's going to choose one out of these two, and we have no idea which one it's going to choose, uh, but we can do the calculation easily uh, for each scenario. Uh, then in, in both scenarios, uh, we can easily calculate that uh, the complex mechanism is going to be strictly better off uh, than the optimal uh, simple mechanism. Uh, so this illustrates that message I, I mentioned a few minutes earlier. Uh, so requiring simplicity for all six types and requiring simplicity for only five of the, the six, six types, so this can be a, a, some difference in whatever you can implement. So if we only require simplicity for five types, so we can, the, the design is going to be better off. Uh, nonetheless, the sixth type is going to be confused. He may do some crazy things, but like I said, this contribution is, is, is this type has only probability one over six, right? So the damage, hopefully, is not going to be too large. So here, indeed, this is the trade-off between the requiring simplicity on all types and requiring simplicity on a subset of types. So this trade-off is actually going to be benefit the, the designer. So this is just one example to illustrate the message, right? Uh, but such, such examples, we believe, can be found in, in many settings, especially uh, in voting, I mean, notably because in voting, you can't get anything done if you have a large domain, but there's uh, many papers that establish in restricted domains, you can uh, implement uh, actually uh, desirable results, such as the single picked or, or top rank, top, top, tops only domains. So formally, so we can make this message slightly more formal by uh, defining uh, implementable, simply implementable outcomes. Uh, so again, uh, in the interest of time, I, I will not go through all these sentence by sentence and illustrate the notions, uh, but to tell you what we are trying to say here. Uh, so we have two definitions here. Uh, the first definition is called an implementation environment has the accommodation of uh, additional types property. And the second definition is to say a design environment has the accommodation of additional types property. Uh, so the first definition, the implementation environment, that's talking about what you can implement on a, uh, on a type space. Uh, so an implementation property, sorry, an implementation environment has this AAT property. Uh, that means if you add more types uh, to the type space, so whatever you can implement before, you can still implement it now, okay? Uh, so the design environment has the AAT property. That's going to be a weaker version because the implementation environment that, that requires the implementable outcome, that is a type by type uh, requirement. Whereas for the second definition, the design environment has the AAT property. Uh, so this is to talk about the, the expectation. We're talking about the expected value of the designer uh, in the smaller type space and in, large, in the large, larger type space. So the AAT probably holds for the design environment if uh, the value, the maximized value on a smaller set, uh, type space uh, is not going to decrease when you enlarge the type space. And the result we have here is, to, is that uh, suppose that the AAT property fails for the implementation environment, then uh, for any full support distribution of types, this, there exists an objective function of the designer such that the best simple mechanism is strongly dominated. Uh, similarly, if the AAT property fails for the design environment, then there exists the full support distribution of types such that the best simple mechanism is strongly dominated. So the two results here, uh, they correspond uh, to the trade-off I mentioned earlier. So why, uh, you want to, you, why you want some types to be confused? Because either they don't contribute to your payoff, so that's the point one here. Because you can construct the pure function of the designer such that the designer does not really care about those types. Uh, then the second reason is 
sometimes happen with low probability. Uh, that's what we're doing here in the, in the second bullet point. We can construct a full support distribution uh, such that the designer will prefer uh, the complex mechanism. So this AAT property, uh, we, we think it's very interesting. So in the paper, we actually spent quite some time talking about in which settings AAT properties ho uh, hold and in which property AAT properties violated. Uh, so one thing we discovered is that uh, AAT property always holds uh, when you have a single agent. So we also spent some time talking about uh, if you have a single agent, okay, whether can we still uh, be able to strategically confuse the agent and achieve a strictly better outcome, no matter what the agent will do when they're confused. Uh, so I will not talk about the proof, uh, but just to give you the result that uh, we can actually construct an example uh, with one agent. This agent has three types and there are six possible outcomes. Uh, then we can show, uh, we, in this example, the optimal simple mechanism is strongly dominated. Uh, for whichever solution concept you are thinking about. If you're interested, uh, uh, you can take a look in the paper. So I will not talk about that here. Uh, then the last result I will talk about today uh, is on the flip side of what we have been discussing so far, uh, is that we try to provide a, a sort of a foundation for simple mechanisms, or at least to provide uh, some understanding of what are the conditions that ensure uh, the optimal simple mechanism is not strongly dominated. Uh, so this has some more notations, uh, but essentially what we're doing here uh, is that we can put all the pair of types uh, of the agent, uh, for each agent, uh, 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 a tree. Uh, this tree would have, to have, would have to have a root and would have to be directed. Uh, therefore, any tree that is rooted and directed, right? Uh, so each edge on this tree it's going to correspond to one particular incentive constraint. Because we only talk about this tree structure, right? So we are not really requiring incentive compatibility for any, to, for any type to mimic any other type. We're only talking about a, a subset of all those incentive constraints. Okay, so we can do this for each agent. Then after we do this for e all these agents, we have a collection of trees. So this collection of trees uh, essentially give you a relaxed optimization problem where you only care about the incentive constraints that are once uh, that correspond to the edges on the tree. So we have two results here. One result corresponds to the uh, partial incentives to participate. So the other result corresponds to the full incentives to participate. So aside from that, uh, uh, the logic, uh, the, the statements are similar. The logic of the proof is similar as well. Uh, so the proposition is uh, simply that. Uh, Suppose that we can't find a tree uh, such that the designer's expected payoff from the relaxed maximization problem corresponding to this clutch of trees is the same as from using the optimal simple mechanism. Then we can conclude the optimal simple mechanism is not strongly dominated. Then uh, if we ask a partial incentive to participate, then the IR constraint is only imposed for the root of the tree. Uh, if we require full incentives to participate, uh, then the incentive constraint is imposed for every single type uh, on the tree. Uh, so this is not really a primitive condition. This principally could be hard to check uh, whether there's a foundation for optimal simple mechanism or not. Uh, okay, I forgot to mention. Uh, so these results, right, uh, they, they're not, they're, so they generalize uh, 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 the methodology uh, yeah, earlier paper. So that's Yamashita's paper, 2015. Uh, it, it follows a similar idea, okay? Uh, so the difference is that we, uh, the original paper only talked about the specific settings, such as single unit auction, uh, parallel trade, and interdependent value auctions. Uh, so here we are sort of generalizing that message uh, to many other settings of uh, uh, interest, as well to generalize to other solution concepts, such as dominant strategy, uh, OSP, and SOSP. Uh, so one thing we could say is that, although this is not really a primitive condition, uh, but there are some works in the literature uh, that tells us like in many familiar settings, uh, this condition is actually satisfied, such as all these uh, one-dimensional uh, allocation problems. So in all these problems, 
uh, we can actually use these results to establish the optimal simple mechanism. It's not strongly dominated. Uh, so you could view this as a positive result that establishes the some kind of uh, optimality foundation for the use of simple mechanisms. So I think I have two or three more minutes. So let me summarize. Uh, so it is widely accepted that agents are not fully rational, right? So we have to think about uh, if we use complex mechanisms, what the agents will do. Uh, it seems appealing that uh, using a simple mechanism that gives us a confidence in our predictions. However, so all our examples, all our results uh, suggest that it may actually be better off for the designer to sacrifice the prediction ability uh, in order to achieve a higher expected payoff. So the two notions we use are the weak dominance and the strong dominance. They are sort of conservative uh, because they require, like in all cases, you are weak better off and sometimes weak better off. So strictly, uh, strong dominance requires a, like you have to be strict better off for all possible cases. Uh, like I said, uh, this is not meant to be a criticism of uh, the notion of simplicity. So I actually think uh, this uh, are very uh, useful results. Uh, so I suppose this paper delivers a, a, a sort of like a warning message. Uh, that is to say that for any environment that we're thinking about, uh, when we're thinking about the design problem, uh, we probably need to do a bit more careful examination. Uh, as to whether we want to optimize within the simple mechanisms or we want to look a bit uh, beyond uh, that, that class. Uh, so there is sort of like a, we, we have many questions that we're interested in. So in the future, so we plan to uh, sort of study the optimal design mechanisms. So in this paper, we are saying that you can do better by using complex mechanisms. Uh, so we hope to develop uh, technologies, uh, techniques uh, that will help us actually solve the optimal design mechanisms in many settings. Uh, one could also discuss other dimensions of simplicity, such as uh, computational aspects or interdependent value settings. Uh, one would be able to, one may want to conduct experimental tests as to see uh, whether some of our complex mechanisms, whether they would really work, especially for weak dominance. Uh, one may also want to think about other notions of uh, dominance as well. Uh, so that's, that ends my uh, presentation.